So far, we've been looking at Blender's interface without exploring just how flexible it really is. In this lesson, we'll take a look at the components and layouts of the Blender UI. The Blender UI continues to evolve with every release. Pen tablets, touchpads, and touch displays are becoming more common as interface peripherals. It's no secret that the interface is highly customizable, and if you wanted to spend the time, you could dive into literally thousands of options available to you. Reassign every shortcut key and adjust the colors of your editors, the fonts, even the icons. But like any good RPG, you eventually want to move on from tweaking your playable character's look and get on with the game. Now, any good application needs to start with an appealing and intuitive interface from Fresh Install. In the past, Blender was not known for this, and maybe I'm a bit biased, but I think it's actually become a pretty intuitive interface over the years when you get right down to it. When you first open Blender, the splash screen gives you a list of preset layouts to choose from for your new file. The one we've been working in so far is our general layout, but there's a preset for 2D animation, sculpting, VFX, and video editing. All of these are just a variation on a theme as we'll soon see. It's probably best to explain Blender's UI using the general layout before we appreciate why these other presets are a good idea to have access to. We've already seen a few things we can do in our interface, such as toggle overlays to display relevant information, show and hide, and even expand our toolbox. In our 3D viewport, there are some menus under view. We can tick to show or hide the toolbox as well as this side panel or a tool shelf, and something called an asset shelf, which we'll look at more closely in later lessons. The hotkeys T and N will show or hide the toolbox and side panels, respectively, in your 3D viewport. You can also click and drag on the side of the toolbox or on this side panel to reveal more information. This white bar makes it easy to see the area that you're manipulating. Now, if the buttons or panels are too large or too small, you can hover your cursor over this area, hold down Control, then hold down your middle mouse button and drag your mouse up or down, and this will shrink or grow these elements. Adjusting the size of your editor panels is as simple as clicking and dragging between the panels. But if you need to focus on a single editor, hover your cursor over that window, then hit Control Spacebar. This will maximize the editor. Hit Control Spacebar again, and you'll be returned to your previous layout. If you're coming to Blender from something like 3ds Max, you might be accustomed to toggling in and out of Quad View. You can do this in Blender also, although it isn't as popular. Here's how it works. Hover your mouse over the 3D viewport. Then use the hotkey Control Alt Q and your view will be split into four sections. You can see them here, the top, the front, and the right orthographic, and up here in the top right-hand corner, the user perspective. You'll see that the toolbox and side panels are overlaid over all of these views as if they were one. Now, this is more of a feature that makes users coming from different software more comfortable, as using the number hotkeys get you the same views but in half the steps and with less keyboard mashing. You can split off, divide, or collapse panels as well. Hover your mouse over any corner of an editor, and when it displays this crosshair, you click and you drag. You should see a dividing line depending on whether you drag horizontally or vertically, but you can gesture slightly in the opposite orientation, vertical to horizontal, and back again. You then drag to where you like it, and you release. If you need to adjust it further, just click on that divide and drag it a little. 
you might notice that the divider will also snap to some bounds, such as the center of the panel that you're dividing. Now, if you wish to join two panels together, right click on the divide, and you should see a contextual menu pop up with icons that explain how you can reconnect these panels. You can also hover your mouse over the boundary of any panel, right click and select how you'd like the panel to split. I'm gonna take a few steps back by combining these two panels, and I'm going to hover my mouse over the top of the 3D viewport, then I'll move this divider down about two thirds. When you split an existing panel, you end up with two of the same type. In this case, I now have two regions that are set to 3D viewport. The icon in the upper left hand corner of any panel tells you what type of editor it is. I'm going to click on the editor type icon in the lower region. This drop down shows all the different kinds of editors that are available. I'm going to select Dope Sheet. This is the editor where you can set keyframes, view and adjust the timings of animations. If we were to save our file now and quit Blender, the next time we open this file, this layout will still reopen just as we left it. Let's talk about the side panel now for a moment. If it's not already visible, open up your side panel by either hitting N or click on this tiny little arrow here or from the view menu. The side panel displays a few tabs. The first is labeled item. This displays the transform properties of our active object. If we select our default cube and display our object properties in our properties editor over here, you'll see that these reflect those transform properties. If I move my cube about, the properties will adjust accordingly in both regions. Where this comes in handy is if we were working on the cube's material or modifiers for the cube, for example. We could keep those panels open and simply see its transform properties here in the side panel. The next tab down is Tool. This displays options for the active tool that we are using. I'll select the cube once again and toggle into edit mode, then choose Bevel. We can now see several options displayed here. Now, they are not dynamically adjustable like in our last action window. They are a more comprehensive version of what we see up here in the tool shelf. It's also why the tool shelf is often disabled by default. Depending on how you prefer to work, you may rather see these properties in the side panel and toggle them from view with the N key, or use the tool shelf because it takes up less screen real estate. The third tab down is View. Here are some options that we might not see anywhere else and are largely underrated. Let's begin with the View panel at the top. In order to better explain this, I'll select my camera object and hit Numpad 0, and I'll swing into Camera View. If we go down to our Properties Editor, you'll see the camera icon for the data panel. Some controls include focal length, clip start and end. If we unhide the viewport display, we'll see this option, it's a fancy French word pronounced passepartout. This is the region outside of our camera bounds, which we can further gray out or make completely opaque. Having this can allow us to see the view that will be rendered, but also be aware of anything outside of that view as we work. Okay, I'm gonna leave our camera selected for the moment, but we'll swing back out to our perspective view by hitting numpad zero again. This will return us to whatever angle we'd set our viewport to previously. In our side panel, we have some familiar controls. There's focal length, clip start and end, as well as passepartout, it has a tick, but is currently grayed out. If we hit numpad zero and look through our active camera once again, the passepartout control becomes active once more and we can toggle it on or off. If we adjust the focal length of the camera, we can see how we can get a narrower or wider view. Now I'll swing back out numpad zero and adjust the focal length again. You'll see that this works for the overall 3D viewport focal length instead of the cameras. 
Clip, start, and end are important for scenes where you need to be very close up or view objects that are very far away. The viewport has a default of 0.01 meters or one centimeter. This means if I zoom into this cube, we will eventually see inside it as it clips away any geometry closer than one centimeter to the viewing plane. Now it's more obvious if we keep our view as it is and instead adjust the clip start. As we increase this, you'll notice that the floor grid and parts of this cube are clipped away. Clip end is just the reverse of this. In the case of the defaults, anything further than a thousand meters away or one kilometer will be invisible to view unless we increase this. Now I'll jump down to view lock, which is a really cool control. I'm going to look through our camera, I'll hit numpad zero, and I can lock that camera to view. What this means is that instead of having to grab and manipulate our camera as an object, I can just pan or rotate my view and the camera view will follow along. I'm going to split off a second view here so we can see the camera from the outside in one of the panels. Now I'll hover over my camera view and I'll middle mouse scroll as if I wanted to zoom in and out. I'll hold the middle mouse and rotate the view. And you can see on the other window how the camera is being manipulated even though we're not using our transform tools to move it. I'll join these views once again and let's jump down to the next panel, 3D Cursor. We already know that if we hold down, shift and right click, we can position the cursor anywhere in 3D space. But here, you can set a precise location and even orientation for your cursor by typing in exact coordinates. Now, if I hit shift A and add an object, we already know that it will appear at that cursor position. Below this, we have a panel that allows us to toggle the visibility of collections without having to do so in our outliner. I'm gonna hover over the 3D viewport, hit control spacebar, so now we don't see any of the other editors, but in our side panel, we can see a list of the collections available to us. We'll skip over local collections for now, as they're a topic for a later lesson. Now the view panel is perhaps the most used tab for side panels. The names of these tabs also come in handy when using certain add-ons. You're probably aware already that I am using an add-on called Screencast Keys right now. This means that you can see the keys as I press them and the mouse commands that I use in real time. I'll open up Preferences and go over to my add-ons to show you my Screencast Keys add-on. If I open up my settings for this add-on and scroll down to where it says UI, I can choose to show these options in the sidebar and I can choose which editor they appear in. Obviously, the 3D view makes the most sense and I can also type in a category. Right now, it says view because that's how I set it. But let's say I type something like key overlays. Now, when I open up my side panel, I have a new tab with this title and all of my screencast key settings are delegated to this. I'm gonna go back and change the category to view again. Now, when I open my side panel, that extra tab has vanished and my screencast key controls are visible as a panel inside the view tab. Okay, that's enough fanboying over the side panel. Let's open up a fresh general preset of Blender so that we can take a look at workspaces. You may have noticed just above the 3D viewport, this row of tabs with names like modeling, sculpting, and so on. Let's click on one of these now. I'm going to choose sculpting and look at what happens to our interface. Our layout is somewhat familiar. We have our 3D viewport here, our properties and outline editors here, and even a toolbox open. But we also have this extra row of icons along the bottom here, complete with its own tabs and search bar. This is the asset shelf, and in sculpt mode, it shows the brushes that are stored as assets. I'll speak more about assets in a later lesson. Now, workspaces 
rearrange the UI in a way that is more conducive to the type of work that you'll be focusing on. In this case, Sculpt Mode toggles the cube's interaction mode from Object to Sculpt, so that we can begin to use the Sculpt tools right away. Let's take a look at a different layout that would be unfamiliar to us at this point. I'm going to click on Shading. Our Outliner and Properties Editor are familiar. The 3D viewport is over here, but somewhat different. There's an environment texture in our background. We have these two spheres here showing a grey diffuse texture and a shiny reflection. Below this we have a Shader Editor with two nodes. There's a Shader node and a Material Output. Then on the left, we have a file browser. And below that, we have an image editor. All of these editors are important to create shaders. As we can access external files from here, drag and drop them from outside of Blender as images to edit, or add them to our shader node tree. This material is already applied to the cube. And we're in Material Preview mode rather than Solid Shading, so that we can see our shader take effect in real time. Now to begin with, these workspaces are pretty good, although you might find yourself tweaking them slightly as you go. Do you notice that at the right end of these tabs, there's this plus sign? Well, this means you can create your own custom layout as well. I'll go back to the default layout to begin with. Then I'll duplicate the layout. We can rename it by double clicking and typing a name there. We can adjust some windows, add some editors, change our overlays, and all of these options will remain in our custom layout, which is automatically saved. Now to finish off this lesson, I'm gonna take you right back to something I mentioned at the start when we first opened our general preset. I can do this by either showing our splash screen like this, I can click on the Blender icon, show splash screen, or simply go to File, New, and choose from any of these layouts. I'm going to choose 2D Animation. Now it seems like it's just a custom workspace, but the difference here is that a preset will also include objects that are necessary for this workflow and omit others. For example, the 2D Animation preset is designed to immediately get you working with Grease Pencil. So instead of a default cube, we have a blank Grease Pencil object as our default object. The world setting is this white background, and our default camera is actually positioned facing directly forward. Our Grease Pencil object has a couple of layers. We are automatically in draw mode, and our side panel is set to the active tool, the brush. Presets can also be overridden. For example, let's say in our general preset, instead of a default cube, we want Blender to open with a default monkey head positioned as if it was sitting on some sort of floor. Let's do that now. We can delete the cube, add a monkey head, I'll rotate it and position it. Then I'll go to File, Defaults, Save Startup File. We don't even have to save this file as anything. We can simply quit Blender, and when we start up again and select General, these changes will have been saved as our new general preset. So now take some time to customize your layout in novel ways that might make more sense to you. Save a workspace or two, or override a default setting. If you make too much of a mess, don't worry, you can always reset Blender to its factory settings. Here's how you do it. Open up a general preset, however that looks, go to File, Defaults, and Load Factory Settings. This will take Blender all the way back to how it looked when you first downloaded it. Then if you're feeling confident, let's move on to the next lesson.